吃的东西，快点啊！快快快，买超多好吃的，来了来了。Gentlemen, I come to you in a time of great need. I need to figure out just what the f is going on with Riot Games' upcoming MMORPG. Was I just f***ing censored? What do you mean I can't swear in the first 30 seconds of a video or it gets suppressed? Do you have any idea how f***ing retarded? So I played each and every single video game relating to the Rune Terror universe made by Riot Games to try figure out what's going to make their MMO so special. I played each of these games to the point that I feel uncomfortably close enough talking about each of them. So hopefully I don't come off sounding like your average YouTube baboon. You might think that you know where this video is going already, and it would be pretty easy for me to lead you along for the next 10 to 20 minutes just to hit you with that same cliche end. PC level byline that we all know by now. That Riot Games is not an innovator, but an optimizer. That they don't churn out new games, they just churn out better versions of old games. Because although that may be true, just like that one time your local priest took you into his private office when you were just a child, this is not heading in the direction you think it is. But let's not fuck about here and get going. We've got a lot to cover. Okay, what's your excuse this time? It's been more than 30 seconds. Surely it's okay by now. What do you mean they changed the TOS again in the last half minute? How is that even possible? Our journey begins the day that Riot Games chose to curse all humanity and bring this blight upon us all. All the way back when that S in their name was more of a suggestion because they only really made one game. League of Legends. The game with the most sensible, welcoming, laid back and non-toxic players you've never seen. No, never before in my entire life have I seen a community so dead set, so allergic to taking responsibility. My god, it's a thing of beauty. Now, Modern League is a far cry from its humble beginnings, way back when Rise was still being accused of being the reason white people exist. But after all that time, the core fundamentals of the game remain completely the same. Now, that is, of course, despite the behavior of some of their newer players. See, I've noticed this trend amongst the younger Zuma League players that have popped up over the years. They seem to think that the gaming happens here. But any true league player knows that that's just a lie we tell ourselves to sleep better at night. The reality is that the true gaming happens here and also sometimes here when you just feel you need a few extra minutes to truly bond with your teammates. All the rest of the stuff in the middle though, that's just there to give you something to do while you wait for your opponents to make their move in the chat box. To the less discerning ear, all of what I've said probably sounds like some kind of joke. But just apply those neurons in your head for a second. That little box means something. In all the hundreds of games of League that I've played for this video and prior to that, not a single time can I remember nothing ever being said. What I'm getting at here is whether you see this as a good thing or a bad thing, Riot knows how to make a game that fosters social interaction. They know how to dig their fingernails right into your untreated mental illnesses. Because while you were gaming, they studied the mind. While you were busy inting, they mastered sunk cost fallacy. And while you wasted your days trying to escape bronze, they cultivated a cash shop. Look, I'm gonna level with you. This game is like crack. You're gonna get addicted and you're gonna suck a lot of dick. But I digress. The funny part is that in modern league, there are now blocked words that if you type out in the chat, you get the tank man on the road square treatment, which hasn't really solved any problems. It's just taught the more colorful members of the league community to get more creative. And I'm not immune to the pull of the chat box either. I can't fully articulate it, but there's almost this irresistible urge to type something, even if your only reward is sending a 14 year old on the internet into a blind rage. And guess what one of the core reasons, or at least used to be a core reason that people played MMOs, the social interaction, the thing that Boomer Book, Thottery Central, and that one chromosomally challenged bird app took from us. We used to spend our time speaking to that one hot elf girl who would turn out to be an unshowered half naked man, forming friendships, creating enemies, or even just messing with someone because you can. These are just a few of the man-made horrors beyond our comprehension that MMOs brought us. 
but focusing a little more on that thing in the background, I've got to say, it's been quite a while since I've last been molested by League. The last time I really sat down to get into this game, Kindred was a shiny new character, and Mordekaiser's ultimate still turned you into his personal cum ghost. Jumping back in, I fully expected the McDonald's employee experience of having no idea what was going on at any given moment. But even during my very first returning game, I didn't do too badly. Controls for League are simple and straightforward. They're basic enough that you can play League all while defrauding thousands of people of billions of dollars. Riot has truly perfected the balance of simplicity and complexity here. League is easy to pick up and play, but difficult to truly master. On the surface, you've only got four buttons to push and a mouse to move around with. But dig just a little deeper and it's far more complex than you were first led to believe. There's picking a role, picking up a champion to master, matchups, positioning, warding, counter warding. <laughs> map awareness, AP versus AD, different builds, crowd control, wave control, auto attack timing, and a myriad of other things to think about. Now the way League gets away with doing this is by front loading all the simplicity and making the complexity something you learn over time as you get better at the game. And if you think about it and squint just enough to blur the lines of racial insensitivity, doesn't that sound like the perfect way to experience an MMO? Simple enough that it doesn't feel like you were flashbanged by the ATF as an infant, but rather that small complex changes to how you play make the difference between being good at League or being a contributing member of society, which means at the same time, if you're playing with friends and they don't know nearly as much as you do, it's not too difficult to cover for their mistakes and get them at least interested enough in the game that they have to pay for your poor life decisions as well. League, as ape shit as its community is, is actually a great case study for game development. Riot have proven that they can keep this tumor up and running for the long haul with consistent improvement over time and variable skill ceilings that suit multiple playstyles. My personal favorite of which is choosing to play as an average sized Vietnamese man who never found out that America gave up all those years ago. There are all these game design philosophies in League that you would want to see in an MMO. Oh yeah, and by the way, all of what I've said here applies to both ARAM and Wild Rift since they're just kind of variations on League, with the only exception being that Wild Rift does a way better job at making people feel the FOMO and getting them to buy a bunch of skins that they don't need. Which, by the way, is also a very common and very lucrative feature that you see across most modern MMOs anyway. But what if League just isn't your pace? What if you're just not able to snort four lines of pre-workout off your forearms, pretend you're T1 and pass out screeching in your local gym while trying to deadlift an unloaded bar? Well then let's slow things down a bit. Let's remove that one hand from the keyboard break out the lotion and open up your favorite website while you play a game that's the equivalent of a digital fidget spinner on your second monitor. Teamfight Tactics, that one auto chess game that uses hexagons instead of squares because anything made by a 10 cent owned company needs to cut corners wherever possible. The first time you jump into or even look at this one, it's far more confusing than League. It's like trying to play a game of poker, but someone's replaced all the cards with anime figurines that are suspiciously sticky. The way they keep your attention though is through the use of familiarity. All the characters here are somewhat recognizable, if not skinned up. And just like in League, there are items you can combine to together and place on your characters to enhance their abilities. The interface, pinging, emotes, and even some of the game mechanics are directly translatable enough back to League that the link is both blatant and a good example of how to associate two completely dissimilar games with the same characters using shared mechanics from each game that are instantly recognizable. You've got champion synergies, positioning, feeding that one champ on your team so they can hard carry, trying not to slip into a coma between rounds, wake the fuck up, samurai, stacking mechanics and suppression mechanics. Now unfortunately the chat box here doesn't have the same alluring pull that it does in League, but that's also because the large majority of these players, if you trace back their IPs, I'm pretty sure you'd find the location of an old age home. And for those younger players who can still remember who their grandchildren are, there's bright sparkly shit and skins everywhere to keep your ADHD under control and your wallet empty if you lack any form of self-control. Now that's all well and good, Rose, but how does this translate to the development of an MMO? I hear your angry typing. Well, remember how I said that a lot of the game mechanics of teamfight tactics change with each season? No, that's because it's the first time I'm saying it. Pay attention. Some of the game mechanics change with every season. The stylization, the characters used, and the rewards available also change too.
2, all while keeping the core gameplay loop intact so that any previous season experience you might have accrued can always be used to waste your time in the next season. What's important to note here is that they're treating TFT like it's a live service game. And if they didn't, people would get bored of it pretty quickly. It's constantly changed and updated with every single season to keep its players from being bored, which also explains why it's one of the most popular auto chess games out there. Now, any YouTuber out there that you follow that's dedicated their life to one MMO and one MMO only has probably complained to you at some point about the dreaded content chasm. What tends to happen is that their chosen torture simulator ejaculates new content right into their eye sockets with the latest patch. They play it all, cover it all on their channel, and then sit there with their thumb up their ass for the next six months because nothing new happens in game. Now you might not know this, but nothing bleats quite like an injured lamb as much as a YouTuber who's not creative enough to make their own content instead of waiting for the game to provide the content they need for them. But most, if not all, MMO players end up experiencing this content chasm too. This happens when you've done just about 90% of everything the game has to offer and aren't usually interested in that last 10% because it's boring, repetitive, or makes you feel like the developer is trying to incept you into slave labor so you'll stick around grinding for measly rewards in their underwhelming world. So what's the solution to this problem? Well, why not turn not just the players into grind slaves, but the developers too. Because as the old Dutch phrase goes, if everyone's a slave, then no one is. All we need to do is turn our game dev studio into our own personal digital content sweatshop. I can't say sweatshop. I swear to God, if you tell me that they updated the TOS again, I'm gonna f And no one seems to have mastered the idea of turning devs into living content mills better than Riot Games and Daddy Tencent at the moment. New skins, themes, cinematics, aesthetic updates, or the Sisyphean task of rebalancing their games because they've learned to rather rotate out what's good instead of trying to make everything fair and balanced for their players all the time. They've just got that kind of stuff honed down because they've been doing it forever. And on top of that, they've already made all the mistakes necessary to get to a functional point that other MMO game dev studios haven't even discovered yet. Now translating that kind of live service attitude to an MMO might just be an ace up their sleeve and not just in the case of throwing out new content. If they've got a problem with their MMO and something needs attention or alteration before a bug ends up new worlding their game, it'll probably be handled. And I mean really, who cares if Zhang Ming hasn't seen his wife in the last six months? As long as he has that bug fix ready by Monday morning if he wants his state mandated bowl of rice for the week. But speaking of aces up sleeves and cards against reality, let's move on to our next game. Legends of Rune Terror. Now what could a card game give us that could realistically match up to what we got out of both TFT and League of Legends? The answer should be fairly obvious. It's Hearthstone in reverse. Now that statement's not going to make much sense if you have no clue what the fuck I'm talking about. I want you to take a look at this card right here. This little bastard right here doesn't just exist in Hearthstone. In fact, you might just so happen to recognize him from some other game out there. Some strange clandestine piece of entertainment, otherwise known as the world's largest MMO to ever exist. If only I could remember what it was called. Now with that same idea in mind, I want you to take a look at this card and this map and these city pathways. And you know what, some of the mechanics while you're at it. See, when Hearthstone was made, WoW already existed and acted as a catalog of characters and lore for the card game to pull from. But when it comes to the Rune Terror universe, the card game already exists, but not the MMO. Hence, copying Hearthstone in reverse. There is an ocean of information here for the dev team of Riot's MMO to work on and pull from that goes harder than Biden spotting an unsniffed child. And on top of that, there are even mechanics hidden in this card game that lay a concrete foundation for either raids and boss fights or even player class abilities. In fact, I'd be quite interested to see how they would implement something like Aatrox's lifesteal without ending up with an overpowered ability. You've got your NPCs, your region themes, story, mechanics, and even some decent voice acting coming out of this card game. All of which are good signs for what they could possibly do with their MMO. And at this point, what more could you need to craft the perfect MMO prison shank that's going to put its fellow competitors in the dirt? We might as well just stop here. We've already got our world setting, social interactions for the players who managed to escape their wranglers at school for long enough, 
crack pipe level game mechanics that keep you addicted and coming back for more, and an obviously skilled team of femboy programmer power bottoms who are right there to rapid fire fix and update this MMO so that there's likely always going to be something to do in this game. Doesn't that sound beyond great? Incredible even. It all sounds like the next MMO masterpiece, right? Wrong. Bad. You goddamn buffoon. You absolute moron. You've been had. You've been bamboozled. You've been taken for a ride. And you don't even see it, do you? So let me lay this out for you as simply as I can. Go to Kickstarter right now and type in the words MMO. And you'll find tons of failure projects, both past and future. All of them dressed like they're the next WoW killer promising those exact same things for just a quick hit of a few dollars from your already empty bank account. So what then makes the Riot MMO any different? Well, the answer unfortunately lies in a game that stole both my time and and my self-confidence. Hextech Mayhem, a goddamn rhythm game. What did I say? What did I say would happen if you censored me again? <sighs> Where was I? Let me make something absolutely clear to the people out there who like to pretend that race doesn't exist. I'm whiter than snow on Christmas, and this is a game all about rhythm. Are we seeing the problem? It took me a lot longer than I would like to admit to complete this one, but there was still an important lesson to learn along the way. If you're really looking to learn to tie a noose because you can't handle your failures, use DuckDuckGo instead of Goo. Riot knows how to coordinate gameplay to match animation timings and any precise inputs, meaning they have an answer to the most important of MMO statements, gameplay is king. And their answer is yes. Now put these on and ignore the fact that we're harvesting your data. Every painful step I took in Hextech Mayhem showed me exactly how terrible I am at rhythm games. And part of the problem was that every time I failed, I knew it was my fault. My timings were off, my reactions and inputs didn't match the beat of the music or the prompts that popped up on screen, and I never once felt like I was being cheated by the game. And even worse than that, I can't even blame any of my on-screen prompts because all of them were clear as day, and the game even went out of its way to explain them to me beforehand. Hextech Mayhem is a nightmare on my unrhythmically cursed soul, but it proves that Riot Games already knows how to build something with highly reactive mechanics where there's always more than one solution to the same problem if you don't have the reaction time of a thumbless hospital patient on morphine. And as an added bonus on top of that, they know how to build a dynamic tutorial that slides right into the gameplay without skipping a beating from your stepdad. Tutorials these days are not something that a lot of MMOs out there get right or even bother with. And the ones that do get it right become a meme in the community like RuneScape's tutorial island. And that might actually help explain why it's so difficult to get teenagers and people in their early 20s to play an MMO and engage in what they consider to be boomer gaming behavior. If you are new to an entire gaming genre or thought you'd try a game out because it looked cool even though you've never played it before, then a shitty tutorial can really kill things for you before you've even started. But a really solid, non-clunky, unobtrusive tutorial that not just tells you what you need to do but shows you, or better yet, yet lets you actively practice before trying it out where it matters, that can make all the difference to someone who still remains untainted by video games. And if you've got a game out there that can do all of that for you and you still can't get it right, <laughs> well then what are you doing here? There's a job opening in the game journalist industry with your name on it. So now onto that previous pile of corpses and money that you need for a functional MMO, we can add reactive and impactful gameplay mechanics with functional tutorials for newbies. But just like being raised in an orphanage, it feels like something's still missing. We could honestly put all these pieces together right now and walk away feeling pretty satisfied with ourselves like a lot of other MMOs out there do. But then how do we know for a fact that all these systems copped from a bunch of different games are going to work together. Where's the guarantee? Well, what if there was a way for Riot to release something akin to an alpha that wasn't really an alpha? Something they could use to gauge just how far off base they are from where they wanna be. Well then, let me introduce you to the last game on our list, Ruined King. I honestly expected this to be a glorified visual novel with a walking simulator strapped to its back, but it's way more than that. This is a full-blown, story-driven, turn-based RPG. Something akin to the older Final Fantasy games, or even Pokemon, 
on in a lot of ways. But do you know what's most odd about this game? I can't shake the feeling that the combat system and mechanics that are put into this game are something that's just been tacked on to the end of it. Maybe it's just me, but it's a little jarring to go from this open world where you're running around, where you can use abilities, you can talk to people, you can make decisions, and then to just be cut off and put into this turn-based little mini game where you fight your enemies. And maybe, just maybe, that's done on purpose. Now, if you follow any of the interviews that Greg Street has done about the Riot MMO, he's been talking to a lot of people who play top-down MMOs like Lost Ark. And guess what Ruined King is? And see, the only thing really missing from the Ruined King that would turn it from an RPG into an MMORPG RPG is the online aspect, a more MMO-like combat system, and a bunch of screeching children on a forum telling you the game is terrible and you shouldn't play it because they keep dying in PvP. Everything else here feels pretty close to what something similar to an MMO that Riot might release in the future looks like. But maybe that's not enough for you. Maybe you still don't believe me. Well then let's take a look at what might make this the foundation for the creation of their MMO. Ruined King's got crafting systems, inventory management, equipable items that change the way your characters look, merchant NPCs for buying and selling items, 3D models that could be ported over to any other game they wish, a leveling system, different character playstyle archetypes, ability-based world interactions, and a fully functional story that people both play and enjoy according to the Steam reviews. And of course, the most important feature that distinguishes an MMO from any other game out there, fishing. This is the game that ties it all together. The one that feels like someone took the internal playtest systems of an actual MMO and turned it into a functional single player game. Rune King proves that Riot doesn't just seem to be making hit games that people like in isolation, but that they've got a trajectory they're following, an internal roadmap to success. And you know what the messed up part is about me spending so much time with this game, playing it to completion? There's a lot to say on how this could relate to an MMO that Riot is developing. But what else could could I really point out that hasn't stuck out in each and every other game that I've covered here. So I'll leave you with this instead. Riot Games isn't just currently the most well-positioned gaming company to make and pull off a banger MMO, but they're also the most well-coordinated to do so. They have a plan for becoming the world's foremost dummy mommy of the gaming industry. It's not just that they've already got almost every single component ready-made and just needs to be thrown together to build their success of an MMO, but they're ensuring that the Rune Terror universe that they've spent the last 14 years building is the focal point for their success instead of just the MMO. Itself. All these games that they very recently made over the past few years act as almost the perfect funnel to take players from one game and push them into a live service world. If you've picked up, played and enjoyed any one of these games, you are a potential customer for their upcoming MMO. Personally, I never would have been interested in World of Warcraft if I'd never played any of the Warcraft RTS games that existed beforehand. And I know I'm not alone. There are other people out there who feel the exact same way about World of Warcraft or even Final Fetish 14. And for all the games I had to complete before I could get this video out, I haven't even touched on the show Arcane, any of the comics, short stories, novels, cinematics, or any other media that exist out there about the Rune Terror universe. Riot Games aren't just out here throwing random shit at the walls to see what sticks and making ultra safe plays the way that other gaming studios are. To me at least it looks like they're taking the risk of attempting to write a full-blown gaming symphony in the same universe. And one of those culminations is an MMO not just capable of captivating the hearts of old fans of the genre, but an entirely new generation who may never have even considered touching a game like this otherwise. And they're not even done yet. They've still got Project L and Project F in the works, as well as Song of Nunu, Convergence, and something about mages complaining about racism again. But now that I've built you up, it's time to knock you down. A word of warning before I leave you to sit and stay. You. Hype is a fickle beast, and my intention here is not to hype you up for a game we haven't even seen alpha footage of yet. The point I'm trying to make here is that, like it or not, we just might be seeing the birth of the next big MMO to dominate the genre, with no equal because Riot Games seems to at least have some clue of what they're doing as a gaming company while everyone else keeps losing market share, keeps yapping about how great NFTs are, or gives way more of a shit about marketing their game to the masses than 
releasing something in a functional state. But let's all try keep our pants on until we see what the game looks like. Because all the promises that Greg Street has given us, all the assurances we've heard about from all the interviews and the takes he's given us on Twitter, it's all just speculation. We won't know the full story of what Riot's been up to until we see some gameplay. That is, if we see some gameplay and the game doesn't get cancelled. There's a technique you can use that could potentially improve the chances of the Riot MMO being good. See, all you need to do is you take your palms and you press them together and you look up and you say, please God, don't let this game be pay to win. Now, as always, big thank to all my subscribers, both old and new. And a special thank to the eternally patient members of the Futures Market Squad who use their life savings to speculate on the condition of my channel and see if I'm going to be able to produce a video this month. Previously, I would have told you that these guys get to see this video early, but now they're getting a few extra perks as well. There's a few more of you now, so I'm trying to make it at least worth your while. Ah, fuck. I'd say I'm becoming a YouTuber, but I still don't feel like molesting any children. Anyway, more content soon.